Hi there. Thank you for joining our presentation on understanding challenging behaviors. We hope that you will find this presentation insightful and helpful. My name is Shayla and I am a recreation therapist as well as a caregiver coach in our caregiver mediated early years autism programs here at Kids Ability. The purpose of this presentation is for service providers and caregivers to learn more about what to do when encountering challenging behaviors. Challenging behaviors easily cause stress in the environment. Behaviors can cause harm or damage, family or staff stress, isolation, burnout. You may experience a lot of feelings around these behaviors yourself, and we want to tell you that that's okay and normal. We're here to support you through it and commend you for taking the time to watch this training video. Our objectives today are to learn about ABA and how it can help with challenging behavior. We also need to define what behavior is and look at when we should intervene. We'll talk about the ABCs of behavior, the functions of behavior, and of course, how to deal with challenging behavior. We work through a scientific approach called Applied Behavior Analysis, or ABA. This is a scientific approach that increases understanding and positively changes socially significant behavior. It's an evidence-based approach to teach new skills and reduce challenging behavior. We do so by understanding how behavior is affected by the environment. This will allow us to make changes that will either increase or decrease the chances of a behavior happening again in the future. In this presentation, we will explore how we can do that. So what is behavior? This is why we're all here. Behavior is anything that people do, including how they move and what they say. It's either physical or verbal, and it is always observable, meaning you can see it or notice it. Behaviors can be considered appropriate or inappropriate. Some examples of appropriate behavior might be asking for toys, waving, running, jumping, rolling a ball, saying hello. If you're attending this workshop, you probably have some examples of inappropriate behaviors. If you're watching this video in a group, this would be a good time to pause and discuss some inappropriate or challenging behaviors that you have experienced. If you're watching it alone, you can pause and reflect on some challenging behaviors that you might like to change or something that you've seen. Here are some examples of inappropriate behavior. Screaming, climbing to access a toy, hitting others or yourself. What else can you think of? Once we name the behavior or we define it, we observe it in more detail to see if there are any correlations or patterns in events that take place immediately before or after the behavior occurs. This helps us determine the function of the behavior. Essentially, it's telling us why it's happening and how the behavior is being reinforced. So we can start looking at ways to modify it. We call this the ABCs of behavior. Here are the ABCs in more detail. So the A stands for antecedent, what happens immediately before the behavior. The B is the behavior itself, so what the person says or does. The C is the consequence, so what's happening immediately after the behavior is occurring. If we understand what happens before the antecedent that triggers the behavior, we can use preventative strategies to help problem behaviors from occurring. Looking at the consequence of a behavior helps us understand what is maintaining or reinforcing it. This is essential for reducing that behavior. Analyzing the ABCs of behavior involves being a good observer. It's helpful to record the antecedents and the consequences to understand the relationship between them. This will help us identify patterns in behavior and determine effective strategies for behavior change. For example, if every time I cry, I get a candy bar, I'm more likely to cry again when I want some candy. We'll talk more about that later. I mentioned that we needed to know what was reinforcing the behavior. And you may be thinking, what is reinforcement? 
Reinforcement is a consequence, so meaning it happens after a behavior occurs. Reinforcement always increases the likelihood that a behavior is going to occur again in the future. We encounter reinforcement in numerous ways every day and all around us. For example, getting a paycheck every two weeks is reinforcement. Reinforcement is the driving force for why we continue to do things and behave the way we do. We want to use reinforcement to promote skill acquisition and positive behavior. It's a tool. Now, despite our best intentions, reinforcement can occur by accident, leading to unintentional strengthening of undesired behaviors. An example of this could include providing a desired toy after a child has had a tantrum. We might think we're distracting them, but it could be reinforcing the tantrum behavior, making it more likely to occur again in the future when the child wants that toy. There is both positive and negative reinforcement, and that doesn't mean one is good and one is bad. Positive reinforcement involves presenting something immediately after the behavior occurs. So an addition of something increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur again. For example, getting a sticker when you complete your homework. Negative reinforcement, again, it's not bad. It involves removing something immediately following a behavior. So the removal increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur again. So completing chores, for example, to avoid being nagged by your parent or putting a seatbelt on when the beeping begins. You want the beeping to go away, so you put your seatbelt on. Even going to the bathroom is negative reinforcement. You're removing the feeling, and that's a positive thing, so you're likely to go to the bathroom again. The following are positive reinforcement examples. So something is being added that increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur again. So if Evelyn is asked to eat dinner, and then she eats her dinner, she gets ice cream for dessert. This increases the likelihood that she's going to eat her dinner again. When Peter's dad tells him to do his homework and he does his homework, Peter gets to play on the computer. He's getting that extra computer time. If Abdul is told his sales quota and he meets his sales quota, he receives a bonus. He's likely to try to meet that sales quota again. Here are some more examples of negative reinforcement. So when we have wet hands, we dry our hands on the towel and our hands are now dry, or the wetness has been removed. If there's loud music on and a child has their hands over their ears and says too loud and then a parent immediately turns that music down so the loud music is removed, then the, the covering the ears and saying too loud is reinforced. If a child is frustrated by challenging homework and they ask for a break, the homework is removed and the child is no longer frustrated. It's important to remember that both positive and negative reinforcement are equally as effective. But the key difference is with positive reinforcement, you're adding something and with negative reinforcement, you are removing something. I wanna make sure that we're a reinforcer too. So pairing is the process by which you make yourself the child's reinforcer. So you wanna pair yourself and your voice with the delivery of fun, motivating items. So while you're giving the sticker, make a silly sound and clap your hands to congratulate them. Pairing is connecting yourself to reinforcement. A child will learn that interacting with you is fun. Good things happen when they interact with you. This will make them want to be with you rather than without you. A fun and motivating environment is going to increase attending and decrease the likelihood of challenging behavior. If you are paired well with a child and you place demands on them, they are more likely to do as you ask because they have fun with you. They want to gain reinforcement from you. If you are not paired with the fun things or the child doesn't see you as a positive person, What's going to motivate them to do as you ask? Not all behavior is bad, and not all behavior requires intervention. So when would we want to reduce the behavior? 
Look at if the behavior is interfering with the child's learning. If the behavior is interfering with the child's social development. Or, of course, if the behavior is a risk to the physical or emotional safety of others. This is just a reminder that we want to remember the ABCs of behavior. So again, the antecedent is what happens before. Behavior is the thing that we're trying to change or what the person is saying or doing. And the consequence is what happens after. We're going to dive into these in more detail now. So an antecedent, remember, is what happens right before the behavior. It can be an event, it can be a person, it can be an object, it can be a place. An antecedent acts as a trigger for problem behavior. It can include aspects of the physical environment. It can even include the behavior of other people. So some examples of antecedents might be the teacher turns the light off in a classroom when playtime is over, a parent turning the TV off, another child stepping into someone's personal space. Understanding these antecedents is an important aspect of behavior change. If we can identify triggers, we can influence the environment and reduce the chance that the behavior will happen again. When defining behavior, we want to look at both physical and verbal components. What does it look like and what does it include? What is the child doing? Next, we have consequence. It's important to note that the consequence of a behavior is simply that. It's something that happens immediately after the behavior occurred. Similar to the antecedent, it can include aspects of the physical environment as well as the behavior of others, and it doesn't have to be negative. Consequences influence the chance that a behavior will happen again in the future. Depending on how we respond, we can increase or decrease its probability. So let's talk about an example. If a child asks for a cookie and the parent says, it's not available, but you can have a piece of fruit or a cheese string, the parent's response is the consequence. Let's say the child asks for a cookie, which is the behavior, and the parent says, it's not available, you can have a piece of fruit or a cheese string, and then the child cries and screams and hits the parent. So the parent has two options. They can say, okay, just this once, and they get the cookie. This is going to increase the chance that the child's going to cry and scream and hit again. Or the parent doesn't get the cookie. So despite the protesting from the child, they're not giving in. They're not giving that cookie. That's going to decrease the likelihood that the child's going to cry, scream, hit again when they're told no. So as you can see, our response will greatly influence whether the undesired behavior or tantrum will happen again in the future. So let's look at an example. Jennifer's mother asked her to pick up her toys. Jennifer screamed at her mother and ran upstairs and slammed the door to her room. Jennifer's mother does not follow her upstairs. She leaves her alone and she does not make her pick up her toys. So you can either pause the video now and facilitate a discussion with your group or reflect on your own to answer these questions. In this example, what is the antecedent? What happened before? What do you think the behavior is? And what is the consequence to that behavior? If most of the time Jennifer was asked to pick up her toys, the antecedent or what happened before, she screamed, ran away, and slammed the door. This is the behavior. And her mother no longer made her clean up her toys. The consequence. Jennifer is going to learn that these behaviors get her out of picking up her toys. Earlier, I mentioned the functions of behavior. The function is the why of behavior. So when we look at antecedents and consequences, we get the whole picture. When we learn the function of the behavior or why it's happening, we can change the environment to decrease the chances of the behavior happening again and again in the future. And we will teach other more appropriate ways to get what he or she wants. 
The functions of behavior can be broken down into four different categories. So the first is sensory. So that's kind of seeking a feeling, scratching an itch, a deep pressure. It can also be finding a feeling aversive. So if the lights are too bright or a room is too loud, or there's a certain food texture that you don't like. Another category is escape or avoidance. So the example that we talked about before with Jennifer cleaning up her toys, she was avoiding the task of cleaning up her toys. So she wanted to get away from something or getting out of something that we don't like or we don't want to do. Another category is attention. That's pretty self-explanatory. So they're seeking one-to-one -one focus from another person. It always involves another person. It's also important to note that it can be positive or negative. So yelling at a child for hitting and telling them not to do that is still attention. Tangible is seeking access to an item, an activity, a food. And behavior can also be reinforced by multiple functions. So it can be more than one of these categories. Let's look at another example. Lucas's inclusion facilitator at camp asks him to put his backpack away. Lucas yells no and throws his backpack. So we thought of some examples of things that the inclusion facilitator might want to do when Lucas does this. So they might want to lecture about why he needs to put his backpack away or arguing about how this behavior needs to stop. That's providing attention. They might follow Lucas around and give him a hug or offer him a bowl of ice cream. That's tangible, so he's getting something out of it. The inclusion facilitator might put the backpack away herself and leave Lucas to be in his room. That's escaping the demand. They might argue with Lucas about putting the backpack away and, they, and then say, I'm not going to argue about this anymore. Just make sure you put it away before dinner. This is providing attention by talking about it and also escape by not making him put it away. Each way that we respond might lead to a different function. If we continue to respond the same way every time he has this behavior, he's likely to continue doing it in the future. Now let's take a moment for some self-reflection. Let's think about a behavior that you yourself repeat frequently. Can you figure out what the reinforcer is? Think about why you keep engaging in this behavior. We can even use a healthy example. It could be exercise. I exercise every day. Why? Because it makes me feel good. Now think about, would you continue to engage in the behavior? Let's say exercise, for example, if it stopped making you feel good? At this point in the presentation, we're going to look at some examples and see if we can find the possible functions to each behavior. Every sunny day, Megan will look out the classroom window through the corners of her eyes and twist her head from side to side. She will do this during playtime, during class time, and whether others are near her or not. During these times, she has difficulty attending to anyone trying to interact with her. This tells us that it is an interfering behavior and maybe we should do something about it. During this time, you may want to pause the video and facilitate a group discussion about what the possible function of this behavior is. If you are watching the video alone, this is a good time for self-reflection. Let's see if we can find the possible function. This behavior could be maintained by sensory functions. It happens when it's sunny and maybe she likes how it looks or the way her eyes feel. 
Because it happens when others are near her or not, it tells us that this is not a socially maintained behavior. So it's likely not attention. Some may guess that this behavior is maintained by escape. Maybe she doesn't want to take part in what's happening in the classroom. Maybe it is maintained by both escape and sensory, so she likes how it feels and she gets out of doing class work. In the second example, when Henry is upset, he will throw himself to the ground and yell loudly. When his mom walks away, he stops crying and he will follow her. When she looks at Henry again, he will immediately fall to the ground and begin crying and yelling again. What do you think is the possible function? The function is likely attention, as he is only flopping to the ground, yelling and crying when an adult is present and looking at him. Here's another example to reflect on. Liam often argues with his mother when it's time to do his homework. It can take up to 15 minutes for Liam to come to the table and even when he's there, little work gets done. It's exhausting for both of them to spend so much time discussing this issue. Liam doesn't seem to understand it would be done faster if he didn't argue about it. What is the possible function? You can pause here for some reflection or discussion. The function could be multiple things. It could be attention. He wants to converse with his mom. He wants to argue with his mom. He's getting something out of this conversation. Or it could be escape. He's trying to get out of the the doing the homework. It could be both. In our final example, Amar is pointing at various objects and screaming during gym class. His facilitators try to give him many items and he only stops screaming when they float the parachute up in the sky. When the parachute touches the ground, he begins to scream again. As they lift the parachute up, his screaming stops. What do we think is the possible function? Now you may have discussed that Amar clearly wants the parachute, which would be a tangible function. He wants a thing. Some may also hypothesize that this might be automatic or sensory, meaning that Amar likes the way the parachute looks in the sky. It could also be multifunctional, meaning that the behavior of screaming is maintained by both wanting the parachute and also a sensory feeling of liking the look. Now we are going to explore some adjustments we might make to decrease challenging behavior in our environment. Just a quick note, we're going to be discussing several strategies for each function. It's not necessary or recommended to implement every single thing that we discuss. It might be helpful to choose one or two strategies that resonate with you or resonate with your staff and start there. 
The first item we will address is antecedent manipulation or things that you might do before a behavior occurs. The purpose is going to be to decrease the likelihood that the problem behavior will happen in the first place. Let's start with some general strategies. So first we wanna rule out any medical issues or concerns. Practice communication throughout the day and try to respond to communication attempts from the individual. We also want to increase predictability, so structured routines, using transition warnings and timers, and maybe some visual supports, which we'll talk about next. Visuals can be helpful because they reduce anxiety and they set clear expectations. They let children know what the reinforcer will be for completion of a task by using a picture of the item or by having the actual item itself nearby. These are just some examples of some visual supports that you might find helpful. If you'd like more information on using visual supports and how to gain access to some visual supports from our team here at Kids Ability, you can watch our Using Visuals presentation. If you have identified that a behavior is maintained by escape, these are some things you can try. So revise the expectations. Consider the demands throughout the day and are there anything that can be changed? Can you make a task more fun? You may need to fade in demands. So if there's a lot of escape behavior throughout the day, it could be helpful to temporarily reduce demands to only placing those that are necessary. So think of those non-negotiables. You have to brush your teeth before you go to bed, or you have to put clothes on before you leave the house. Those are non-negotiables, but some things we can negotiate on. Like you don't have to put your plate in the sink. That's something you can work towards or slowly fade in over time. Providing choice is very helpful. For example, what order do we want to complete the tasks in? Where do we do it? What should we use? So we have to brush our teeth. Which toothbrush do you want to use? Or we have to brush our teeth and we have to get dressed. What do you want to do first? The task still gets done, but the child has some shared control over aspects that don't affect the outcome. We can also provide some scheduled breaks and provide effective instructions. So first you wanna gain the attention of the individual and reinforce them for paying attention. And then provide short directive statements. So avoid phrasing it as a question. It's not, do you want to brush your teeth? It's now we are brushing our teeth. You can use first then visuals or language. So first brush your teeth and then we can read a book. First, put on your shoes, and then we can go outside. You want to make sure these contingencies are reasonable. You can use a visual support, or you can just use the language. It may also be helpful to use priming. So this is just a fancy word for telling the child what to expect or giving them a warning. You can find social narratives or video modeling on our website, but you can also search this on YouTube. For example, what to expect at swimming lessons or how to behave at camp. This is going to provide more predictability and get the child ready for what is to come. Next, we're going to talk about some things you can try to do before the behavior if it is reinforced by tangibles or access to an item. You might try providing scheduled access to a desired item and removing the item from site when it's not available. We might want to prime or give warning before transitioning away from a desired item or activity. So for example, you can use a timer for when iPad is going to be all done. Replace desired items with other desired items. 
For example, cars are not available, but you can play with trucks or trains. Or if you need to take something away, we call this a reinforcer exchange. So I'm taking the iPad and here's a gummy bear. Again, you can use visual supports to show your child when they can have an item. This might include a first then or a token board. A token board will look like you get five stickers and then you can have the iPad. Here are some things you can try before the behavior if it is maintained by attention. So provide structured attention time. For example, we get five minutes of cuddles when we wake up. We want to intersperse positive attention proactively. For example, if you're working or talking on the phone, intersperse brief moments of attention, like giving your child a thumbs up or a quick hug for a couple of minutes. When we're making dinner or doing laundry, you could give the child a special job and provide lots of praise and attention while you're still able to do your chore. It's a good idea to set up activities that your child enjoys that they can do without your help or attention. You can reserve a bin of items like this for when your child typically wants your attention. I like to keep a bag of fun stuff in the car, for example. When a behavior is maintained by a sensory function, it can be a little bit tricky. So the first thing you want to do is rule out medical reasons, so consult a physician. If your child seems to have sensory seeking or sensory avoiding behaviors, it might be helpful to consult with an occupational therapist. You can have sensory items available to, and teach your child to ask for it. So like a chewy necklace or headphones if, if they're sensitive to sounds, fidgets to keep their hands busy. We may teach appropriate times or places to engage in the behavior. So it, it's not okay to run around the library, but you can run in the park. It's not okay to sing loudly during class time, but you can sing loudly at recess. Schedule times or teach ways to ask for this time. You might want to have scheduled breaks or have a break card. It's important to teach a replacement behavior or what we want to see the child doing versus what they are doing right now. Often, we see children using inappropriate behavior to gain access to a reinforcer. So that's function, the attention, escape, tangible. This is a learned response. So it has been previously reinforced and the behavior serves the child because they've learned that when I do blank, I get blank. We need to teach them something else to get that reinforcer. Let's talk about an appropriate replacement behavior. So for example, if Georgia will walk up to her peer and grab toys. When the peer comes back to take the toy, Georgia hits the peer, and then the peer stops trying to take the toy back. The function of this hitting behavior seems to be tangible. So Georgia gets the toy she wants by grabbing, and then she keeps the toy by hitting. So how are we going to teach Georgia a better way to get the toy? When we're teaching a replacement behavior, keep in mind that it must be easier than the problem behavior. So it has to be easier and more accessible to Georgia than the hitting. Access to the reinforcer or the toy must happen more frequently than when she hits. It also must happen more quickly than when she hits. So we want to choose a word, a phrase, a sign, a gesture, even a picture card to teach Georgia to ask for the toy. It's a good idea to have on hand two of the same toy so every time Georgia asks for it, she will get it. Here's a quick reminder of what the ABCs of behavior are. So we've already talked a lot about what we can do before the behavior happens or in the antecedent. We know what the behavior is, 
Now let's look at consequence. So what happens after the behavior and what can we do to lessen the chances of the behavior happening in the future? Consequence strategies are going to be things that we do after the behavior has occurred. These strategies aim to either reinforce a different desired behavior or reduce the undesired behavior. Strategies can be paired with validation, and of course, we can use some co-regulation support. So empathetic statements like, I know that was really hard, or offering a hug. Now let's talk about responding to problem behavior that is maintained by the escape function. So if you are able to remove or delay the demand, you can do that, prompting an appropriate refusal. This is the, the replacement behavior. So it can be a gesture like shaking their head or words. You can prompt them to say, can I do it later? Um, they can exchange a break card or do a sign. You're going to reinforce this appropriate communication by removing or delaying the demand. If this isn't possible, decide which elements of the demand you're going to maintain. You can always reduce the expectations. So if you ask a child to clean up, you can adjust the expectation by just having them put away one piece, making the, the demand much easier for them. You always want to follow through on your expectation. You may have to help your child by hand over hand putting those toys away or giving them some guidance by give, bringing them the toy basket. We do want to reinforce and praise any steps towards cooperation. So when they put that one toy away, you're going to say, oh my gosh, you cleaned up your toys. That was so amazing. What can we do after a behavior has occurred if the behavior is maintained by tangibles or items? If you are able to provide the item, you can prompt an appropriate request. Again, that replacement behavior. So just teaching them to ask for it. In our example with Georgia, teaching her to ask for the toy and making sure she gets the toy for asking for it. So reinforcing by giving the item. If not, tell your child that it's not available and then you want to prevent access to the item. If you've said that it's not available, then it's not available. If this means you have to put it out of sight or out of reach, that's a good strategy. We can redirect to alternate items and these items can even be really reinforcing. You can give choices, like the car is not available. Do you want to play with trucks or trains? You want to provide some nonverbal modeling and redirect, redirecting. So if the car is not available, you can start playing with trucks and wait for them to join you. Again, we want to reinforce and praise every step. So if they start playing with the trucks, you're going to tell them that you think that's great. If the behavior is maintained by attention, you can prompt them to appropriately request that attention. I'm sure you're seeing a theme here. We want to get them to ask. That's our replacement behavior. So you can have my attention if you tap me on the shoulder, if you call my name, if you sign that you want to play. Reinforce by providing high quality attention when they appropriately ask for it. If it's not possible for you to give attention, we want to re reduce attention to the problem behavior. You don't have to say nothing or remove attention completely, but we want to avoid arguing, scolding, commenting on the behavior, maintain a neutral tone and expression, ignore the behavior. That doesn't mean ignore the child, ignore the behavior. Redirect the child to what they can do instead without your help or attention. You can use a first then, so first do this puzzle and then I'll play with you. If a behavior is maintained by sensory properties, we want to follow recommendations from an occupational therapist or a doctor if applicable. We can redirect to alternate items or activities that serve the same function. For example, if a child is melding their clothing and it's ruining their clothes, we can provide a chew necklace for, for melding instead. They might need headphones to block out aversive sounds. We can also redirect to an appropriate place or time to engage in the behavior. 
For example, if a child is engaging in a spitting behavior, we can move them to a sink and say, this is where you can spit. We hope you learned some useful strategies today. Here are some additional tips to dealing with challenging behavior. Always reward the positive. Be consistent and ensure that you pair with the children you're working with or dealing with in the home. Try to address behaviors when they first occur so that it doesn't become a learned behavior. Plan ahead. If you're working with other caregivers, make sure you're on the same page and doing the same things. Choose your battles. Do we really care about this, this behavior and is it worth trying to change? Because we know it's going to be a little bit of work. Be patient and don't give up. And it's always helpful to allow the child or individual a sense of control. This information is just the beginning of understanding and dealing with challenging behaviors. We want to highlight that for severe behaviors where someone is in danger, please consult any community partner involved with your child's care. Thank you for watching today. If you have any specific questions or need further assistance, please don't hesitate to email us at rectherapy at kidsability.ca or at youthengagement at kidsability.ca.